Um, All right, we're going to get started soon as everyone gets their lunch. Oh, look. Michelle. Oh, Michelle. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Michelle. All right. So let's start. I also just want to welcome people. This is much, this is informal. If you want to, you know, sort of um, get more food, please feel free to go back and, and, and get more food and then come back up. But we, um, well, first I should probably introduce myself. My name is Professor Lian Hang Wen, and I'm the director of the Weatherhead East Asian Institute, co-founder of Vietnamese Studies, um, and the Dorothy Borg Associate Professor in the History of the United States and East Asia. Uh, I'm very excited um, to introduce uh, our speaker today. Uh, his name is Peter Mack. Uh, I don't know how to introduce you. You have so many uh, accomplishments and accolades, but I'm going to first start with the personal before I actually list um, all of Peter's credentials, his titles, uh, all of his accomplishments. Um, Peter and I have known each other now for... Five years, five years, but it really feels much longer in a very good way, meaning that Peter uh, has become like family in such a quick amount of time. And I think a lot of that is because we see each other in Vietnam, uh, as well as when he comes here to the United States and to New York, uh, but also because of everything we've really done together to build Vietnamese studies here at Columbia University. Um, Peter is just, and I'm not exaggerating, uh, probably the most exceptional human being that I know in terms of everything that he has overcome to get to where he is now. And you'll understand that, especially as you as you hear his his life story. Um, so to that end, let me list the the accomplishments. So Peter, you graduated here from Columbia uh, in 1995. So CC class of 95 and then SEPA class of 96. I hope you will tell us how you got to Columbia, and that, again, will be a story that that it's his to tell. Uh, but upon graduating from Columbia, you worked um, as executive director. And, and I'm going to say this because, again, this he's very, he's, he's really representative of the Weatherhead East Asian Institute, or at least in, in terms of what we hope our grads do. So he worked as executive director at Goldman Sachs in New York and Hong Kong. Uh, after that, he became managing director at Credit Suisse in Hong Kong, founded, co-founded Viet Bridge Capital, uh, which is based in Vietnam. You've also been to Singapore. This is when you uh, were partner of the hedge fund, HDH Capital. And then ultimately, and I think this is your most recent title, is CEO and founder of Tanzanite International. So builds probably the most luxurious resort hotel uh, in Vietnam in a town called Ho Tram, very close to Vung Tau and has built the very first pier uh, in, in, in Vietnamese history. So again, this is a Vietnam's first pier. Why I was identifying Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, uh, other places that Peter has been is that again, you're sitting in the Weatherhead East Asian Institute and next year we'll be going on our 75th anniversary. Um, and what we hope happens is that when we have students who major in East Asian languages and cultures, along with econ, uh, or go on and get a master's from SEPA, that they do this, that they work in so many sites in Asia and build up that expertise and develop the Columbia communities and networks uh, in Asia, and then come back and help us reestablish those ties. Peter has done and is doing all of that. Beyond Peter's work experiences, his, his titles, Peter is also a um, dedicated philanthropist in higher education. He started what is called AMA. I'll let Peter talk about that, but it provides scholarships to underprivileged, disadvantaged students in Vietnam to go on to higher ed. Uh, he's also on the Global Advisory Board of Fulbright University of Vietnam, so is a few of the members here in the audience. Um, and lastly, he started uh, what is called uh, Technology for All, which provides full scholarships and internships to underprivileged students at prestigious universities in Ho Chi Minh City with a focus on uh, technology. So why Peter uh, is doing all of that and how Columbia in particular is positioned um, to invest in uh, in Vietnam and Vietnamese studies really lies at the crux of what, when we started this, was going to be a conversation. But I think it will it will 
kind of develop into that, but I'm going to I'm going to turn the floor over to Peter first, um, so that he can do a short presentation, and then I think I'll have questions. I'm pretty sure you all will have questions, uh, but this is really a talk that pulls a lot from uh, Peter's experiences here at Columbia. Uh, where he sees the landscape of higher education in Vietnam today, um, and what really, you know, sort of is in store for the future uh, in terms of, uh, for Peter personally, as well as for Vietnamese studies at Columbia uh, and the country of Vietnam itself. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over uh, to Peter Mack. Well, thank you, Professor Hung, and thanks to all of you for attending this talk today. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, so thank you for making the time. I'm sure for many of you, it's partly because of the free food. For, so thank you for seeing the East Asian Institute for that. Um, I did prepare a more structured presentation so that we can uh, have a, a very good conversation around the structure. Uh, but since she brought up a lot of other topics that are quite uh, you know personal, uh, I'm happy to talk about that separately from my presentation. But let me really summarize a little bit of my life before I start the presentation. So I, uh, I grew up in the Bronx here. So I left uh, Vietnam in 1984 as a refugee. Um, and we came here uh, under the Amerasian Homecoming Act in 1984 with my adopted father and his two children. And, um, you know, at that time, I had uh, no formal education, did not study, uh, did not know English. Uh, I went to Fordham, uh, where I went to visit this morning, I uh, got um, I finished high school there and came here to Columbia in uh, 1991. Uh, and when I came, <clears throat> uh, I think uh, there was no Vietnamese studies program for sure. Uh, I was very interested in becoming a Latin teacher. I was a, a lover of uh, the classics uh, from high school training, from a Jesuit education. So I wanted to go into uh, 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 Latin uh, studies uh, in terms of literature and philosophy and become a Latin teacher. But very quickly, thanks to Columbia, I changed course and became very interested in East Asian history um, and, and particularly about my past to understand, you know, where I came from uh, so that I really know what to do with my life from that point onwards. Long story short, um, I decided to major in ELAC, uh, East Asian Studies, starting second year. And if you look at the... Uh, for sure, it's back then, I think you only see Korea, Japan, China, uh, Southeast Asia, I think was not even on the map. You might be able to take a course or two, uh, but certainly there was no major or minor. There was no language class. By the end of third year, or yeah, I started my thesis, which is a part of ELAC requirement, and I decided to explore uh, the history between Vietnam and China between 1979, 1991, uh, you know, basically from the war during that period in 78, 79, all the way to 91, when they reconciled their relationship. Uh, and there was really no other student uh, going into this field of study at the time at Columbia. And I subsequently had to come to SIPA to find Professor Jack Vesnan, uh, who was a very prominent figure, but really focusing mainly on Indonesia, uh, Thailand, and the rest of Southeast, Southeast Asia. He knew I think a bit about Vietnam, but if I remember correctly, uh, not to discredit him anything, but that based on credentials, I think he, he was very familiar with Southeast Asia, but not an expert on Vietnam. There was no expertise on Vietnam at Columbia at the time. Uh, but I was very curious, you know, so I, I wrote a thesis on this topic, and I always share this with Bessa Hung because I'm so happy to see what, uh, you know, the East Asian Institute has done under uh, her leadership ship and, um, and John's and, and other professors here uh, is really incredible that what the offerings are today and what the students uh, can take advantage of uh, should they be interested in Vietnam and, and in the region of Southeast Asia. I think with that said, let me start with a more structured conversation and I'll take questions from you after. I'm happy to share anything you want to hear about my past. Um, so I think, maybe, let me see if this is working. I think it's better for me to stand up so I can see the screen while talking to you. So I'm gonna give you a perspective from um, an alumni perspective, as well as a practitioner in business and uh, education philanthropy in Vietnam. And a question posed to me by Professor Hung was really, you know, I guess if you look at the flyer, you know, why should Columbia invest in Vietnam studies 
or in Vietnam in general? You know, why should you be interested? And um, <clears throat> so I just came up with this slide for food for thought, for, you know, things for you to think about. So I think, firstly, let me start by saying or asking, did you know that President Obama 10 years ago was the guy who developed and established the strategic relationship, not strategic, comprehensive relationship with Vietnam. That was 10 years ago. So Clinton obviously went in in 95 to um, renew diplomatic relations, but Obama went in to really start this 10-year period, the last 10 years, to upgrade it, develop it into a comprehensive relationship. So President Biden just came uh, recently around September 10th and upgraded that further to the highest level, which is the comprehensive strategic relationship. But I put this slide because one, President Obama is a Colombian. So Colombia is already contributing uh, to, uh, to Vietnam uh, 10 years ago uh, by developing really a very important relationship for the U.S. going forward. Uh, and he's a Colombia, and we can latch onto that to end the Colombia legacy in Vietnam. And as you can see, the Vietnamese do love President Obama. He was a rock star when he was there. Let me share 10 things with you. I think sort of laying the groundwork, and we can ask a lot of questions around these topics. So firstly, we have a population of 100 million, right, as of April 2023. We're the 15th largest country in the world. Secondly, I will go into the economic argument in terms of why you should invest in Vietnam and why Colombia should get more involved. We enjoy the fastest urbanization rate in Asia. It's 40% at the moment. It's growing about 2% per year. China, I think right now, is about 60%. But we're growing very fast. We're urbanizing very quickly, becoming a much larger economy. And 66% of our consumption of our GDP growth is driven by consumption. So we have a very strong consumer base. Um, it's one of the largest global economies, eight, uh, growing very quickly at 8% in 2022, 5% in 2023. This is a very slow year. We can talk about that later. And projected to be 6.4% in 2024 by HSBC Vietnam, which I think has the best expertise on Vietnam. Hopefully, our population is extremely young. We're one of the youngest populations in the world with a very strong and educated labor force. So we're basically 55% um, uh, under the age of 35. I'm educated. Uh, this is something you may or may not know. 77% of young ladies attend high school, higher than the boys of 68%. But this is actually amongst the highest in the world. This point we'll go into later, that we're very outward oriented. If you look at China, social media is pretty much banned. You don't see Facebook, right? And other social media platforms there. But in Vietnam, it's pretty much an open architecture, right? We have over 7 million users on Facebook. It's uh, by Verzalo. I mean, they have it. Uh, and I can kind of talk about some examples of that in terms of how an average citizen can interact with politicians and policymakers through social media. You'll be surprised. Seventh point is uh, female participation rate is extremely high. It's one of the highest in the world. I mean, you go to Vietnam, you look at listed companies, private companies, we have more mature women than any other country in the world as a percentage of population. So 28% of CEOs, CFOs like are women compared to 19% globally. And this is, this is an interesting history that we can discuss later in terms of why that is. The point is that in this China plus one strategy, as you may have heard, starting 10 years ago, but it's really intensifying in the last few years as the China is repivoting, uh, uh, U.S. is repivoting against China. So in this China plus one movement by manufacturers, what you're seeing is that everyone's leaving China or Vietnam, Indonesia, or India. But Vietnam clearly is one of the biggest winners, if not the biggest winner, on this China Plus One strategy and repositioning by the U.S. And all the businesses have to reposition as a result if they want to do business with the U.S. and its partners. So recently, for example, you see Apple announcing that from now on, we're going to start making MacBooks and Apple Watches out of Vietnam. So what happens is Foxconn, the largest manufacturer for Apple, 
right? Mm -hmm. He's been investing in Vietnam and doubling, tripling down, moving his factories into, into Vietnam as a result away from, from China. Some are going to India, but if you look at India's data, and we'll talk more about this later, out of 7 million firms, 6.5 there's in India, 40 Indians. So the Indian manufacturers are not producing for the world like China is. India is for India. So which means that who is going to produce for the world? Very likely Vietnam, Indonesia. Uh, Samsung is doing the same thing in terms of semiconductor parts, and I'll talk a little bit about that with some slides. Next point is that we're really following the steps of Japan, Korea, Taiwan. I mean, many of you here being students of uh, uh, and professors in this area have more expertise than me when it comes to Taiwan, Korea, and, and, Taiwan, and um, Japan. We don't want to just become um, sort of an outsourced manufacturer. How do you grow from there to become a technology powerhouse like some of these countries? So the model for development, the ideal model from the Vietnamese government perspective, are these three countries that have these technology technology breakthroughs, new technology transfer, knowledge transfer. How do you take your country, you know, from less developed to more developed to extremely developed like these countries where they become leaders in those fields, whether it's semiconductor or the types of technology and nowadays in AI. So the Vietnamese government, when we, we, we sponsored the Columbia Conference in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh, the experts on trade from the government who came to speak to us talked about this, is I like, want to avoid the path of Thailand because they get stuck being a manufacturer for decades. So how do you leapfrog above that? And we can talk about that later. That's where Vietnam is heading and thinking. And lastly, we talk about geopolitical later. China is our largest trading partner. We buy more goods from China than any other country. So we do run a trade deficit against China, and we run a huge trade surplus with the U.S. So the U.S. is the largest export market, but China is extremely important to Vietnam. So we have to play a balancing role to basically keep doing business at the same time, you know, have a very strong defense strategy. So these are the 10 things that I just want to highlight as the backdrop. This is an example in terms of Vietnam's openness since 2007. So we entered the WTO, and then of course the crisis came in 2009. Actually, 2007 was the year that I went to Vietnam. I left banking, started my own business, and I was very excited about Vietnam. I put I uh, represented Credit Suisse to uh, do the IPO for Vietcom Bank in 2006. And we did a lot of structured bond financing uh, in 06 and 07 for other companies. And that basically got me the Vietnam itch to leave my investment banking days and pursue business. So I moved to Singapore. I was in Hong Kong for 10 years. And I moved to Singapore, left Credit Suisse um, to start my own fund, Vietnam fund, to invest into the growth. Uh, so I lived in Singapore for 10 years. But those 10 years in Singapore, I basically fly weekly into Vietnam to take advantage of investment opportunities. So I had an Hanoi office and I had a Ho Chi Minh office, uh, about 50 people, investment professionals. So I've been in Vietnam investing since 07, personally on my, uh, on, on my own, on the comp uh, with the company I, I established. As a banker, I started earlier. I left in 84, I went back in 93 to visit my mother. I've been going back every year. I wish I had a study abroad program. I would have latched onto it and come back to Vietnam, um, but we didn't. So I basically had to do it based on my own. But I'm saying 18 free trade agreements since. If you remember TPP, TPP would have been great for Vietnam. We would have been the biggest beneficiary, but with the you know politics getting in the way, first with Trump, then even Hillary Clinton had to let go of TPP. But Vietnam bounced back from that by signing individual and regional trade agreements. And we still have quite a few more on the table right now. But probably more of FTA is signed compared to any other country on earth right now. So it's a very open, globally engaged economy right now. So that creates opportunities, of course, some vulnerabilities as well when you have global demand slowdown like right now. And I would say the next thing you want to be aware of is that similar to China in the mid-90s onwards, 2000 onwards, when I moved out to, with Goldman Sachs in 97, and the 
month that I moved out, immediately we participated, or I participated myself in the IPO of China, uh, China Mobile, right? So in the late 90s, China started privatizing its state-owned enterprises, listing the companies largely in Hong Kong, lifting on in the US. Vietnam is beginning that phase right now. This has been their dream for many, many years. So VinFast just became the first of these companies to list NASDAQ. Next one, Vin Games already announced their intentions. So the question is, with who's next? There are a lot. I want to guess I'm with more companies that will be listing uh, in NASDAQ. But this is really a new era when Vietnam is trying to globalize its state owned enterprises. And in this case, these are private enterprises. But I think this is really the beginning of something new, similar to the era of China listing its state owned enterprises. And this will go on for decades. I mentioned earlier, Professor, uh, sorry, uh, President Biden came recently and upgraded our relationship to comprehensive strategic. Now, this is really important. To put things in perspective, Vietnam has been and has the same relationship with China. So Vietnam is not trying to pick sides. Vietnam wants to continue doing business with China and wants to develop new opportunities with the US, whether it's defense or commerce. And at the same time, we do not want to upset China. So we want to be as neutral as possible and continue to trade with as many partners as possible at the same time, looking after our own interests, especially in defense. Um, what's interesting about this is we'll, we'll go into this later and then Professor Nathan will have a lot to say about this in terms of what that means for the US, US China relationship and how Vietnam fits into that picture. What's interesting is right after Biden left, Okay, the U.S. government, almost on the same day, if you look at the State Department website, they made quite a few announcements, one of which is they're going to invest in this ITSI fund uh, based on the CHIPS Act of 2022, and the CHIPS Act is really targeting at, uh, at China, right? And Vietnam is part of that pivot strategy. So what this partnership means is that we're going uh, to build out our semiconductor industry. We're going to become a more important factor going forward in, in the global supply chain, especially when it comes to semiconductor chips. And that has massive implications for everything, including AI especially. Now, why don't we talk about this? This means, right, out of this, they estimate that over the next 10 years, for this partnership to work with the US in building out semiconductors, eventually manufacturing chips out of Vietnam rather than TSMC in China or TSMC in the US, they're building our factory in the US too, we need to increase manufacturing out of Vietnam. And it starts now. The race starts now. Now, there's, there are a lot of concerns about whether this is going to be a success or not. We need 50,000 engineers. Today in Vietnam, we have 5,800 engineers available for this effort. So about one tenth of what we need in the next 10 years. So we need to start developing the talent and the know-how now through education um, and through technology transfer. So FPT University, so FPT is, for those who don't know, is a listed company in Vietnam. It's exactly like a Microsoft, right? They provide IT solutions, integrated services, uh, really creative. They're also in, in education. FPT University is very successful and popular. So they announced that they will be starting a semiconductor and circus department. And they will need in educating uh, some of the brightest minds of Vietnam to become chip designers. My contention is we can take part in this as a Columbia community. If we pitch the engineering school C's to the to Vietnam government and say, we want to take your brightest minds and train them to the best engineers to suit the needs of the semiconductor uh, industry, 
I think that's the perfect matchup. That would be one of my arguments, right? Is piggybacking off a very important geopolitical relationship in a very important and sensitive industry. And there's tremendous need in this sector alone. So I would argue that would be one angle why we should invest in Vietnam on back of this important relationship alone. Now, to give you an example of the open economy, how, how I think open-minded we are, um, you look at Bloomberg Business Week, I participated in the grand opening and uh, Ms. Susan Burns is there and uh, I think her daughter's in the audience, <laughs> Lisa. Um, and this just highlights the importance of the U.S. relationship to Vietnam and also vice versa, um, which is that you know we continue to invest in U.S. businesses like Bloomberg Business Week through my friends there. And this is, uh, you know, if I can see, so I bought a copy. I unfortunately left in the hotel room, but I'm, I'm the first original copy for Professor Hamilton to keep here. It's not in circulation yet, but uh, I brought a physical copy for you. Uh, and um, I think this you should subscribe. It's not in Vietnamese, but the digital version is in English. Um, so I think you'll get some uh, probably the best quality news on Vietnam's economy uh, and, and opportunities across different areas in business. Uh, but eventually, I think they'll cover more areas. Um, <clears throat> but things are moving very quickly in Vietnam right now. And I think lastly, so, you know, we talked about, we talked about um, business, right, geopolitical, um, and I think educational. Like I said, Obama was already a Columbia plant in Vietnam doing good work for us. But you know, under the leadership of uh, Weatherhead here and Professor Hung and other professors and audience, you know, we're very well positioned in Vietnam today. Uh, I think the Vietnamese government knows that Colombia takes Vietnam very seriously and is very sincere in helping um, uh, Vietnam in terms of education and promoting Vietnam studies here in the U.S. So I think it's really the right time uh, to take advantage of this opportunity and grow that relationship across so many different angles. And to deepen that, uh, similar to say, in the past, what Columbia did in China, or what other universities like Yale did with China. I mean, one thing I learned when I was here at Columbia was that, uh, you know, I think when China was pursuing a new China movement, when it was really trying to democratize, you know, the first, Minister of Education from China, I believe, studied at Yale, Mr. Yongwing. And they developed the Yale China program. And I think Columbia did think is at that point. You can develop the same relationship with Vietnam. You have this opportunity today to basically take advantage of all the progress that's been made in the last 10, 15 years. But in the field of education, higher education, I think this is that moment that we should recognize to take advantage of that and seal that level of relationship and develop it from here. And you reap rewards for the next decades to come. Fulbright is an example of that, right? So Professor Hung and the team signed uh, MOU with Fulbright, other universities like the University of Social Sciences. The point is we already have strong roots there that no other university has at the moment. So take advantage of it, now is the time. I put this up on the website just to remind you of your good work. Yeah. So I think you have support from the highest levels of government, right? And we can engage the private sector uh, and beyond to really support this effort. And I think lastly, I just want to show you the vibrancy of Ho Chi Minh City today. You know, I think we're, like I said, there are a lot of opportunities, lots of needs in education to serve. And you know, I'm an investor and I can feel the timing. This is the time that I think Columbia should invest to really deepen ties and build on all the progress that have been made. So thank you. I'll take questions from here.
just want to say that we need to send this to President Manu Shafiq, uh, to Dean Shifu, to Dean Karen Yarhimilo, <laughs> everyone involved. Um, thank you so much, Peter. I, I'm going to take moderator's uh, prerogative and, and I guess throw out the first question because, uh, you know, this was the that picture of me in the um, the prime minister in which it's a joke. I pushed everybody out of the way so I could be the first to shake his hand. I pushed the Harvard professors, the Yale professor. Um, but the question that, you know, I I went a different direction. And while I think, you know, I, I cited, you know, the the course of modern Vietnamese history and said, really, you know, it's, it's your people that won the war, the revolution, reunification, et cetera, invest in, in your human capital. But I didn't go the sort of uh, specialized curriculum and not even really identified engineering, but said it was really about providing uh, a broad based liberal arts education at the at the undergraduate level that if you really want to invest, you have to have, you know, sort of global citizens that not only invest um, in, in, in Vietnam and its future and its development, but also to be global citizens to sustain 21st century peace. If Vietnam were the greatest victims of the 20th century violence of that Cold War, what, what position does Vietnam, uh, what can it uh, hold for the 21st century Cold War if we are indeed in one? Um, so it went a little bit, you know, sort of different. And I think the prime minister would have enjoyed your presentation more because he's like semiconductors, engineering, <laughs> supply chains. Um, but I was pushing the sort of liberal arts uh, undergraduate, you know, sort of education based model that is really not so much FTP, but more FUV. So where does that lie in a sort of your presentation that that focuses a little bit more on engineering and the needs that is totally true. No one can sort of um, disagree with you, but is there particularly in a communist country like Vietnam, uh, how would they be able to sort of straddle that and should they do that? Would it sort of, you know, kind of hold the seats to their, uh, for the party, the one state party, uh, its demise if they do? Yeah. Um, it's a very interesting topic. Um, I can share some thoughts on it. Um, obviously, the immediate needs, you know, could be semiconductors, sciences. But if you look at development of any country, particularly Vietnam, in the, on a the longer term basis, I think liberal arts becomes even more important. Um, take Singapore, for example. Singapore follows the educational model of largely the UK. Uh, they're, they're great exam takers. They, they score some of the highest IB scores around the world. Um, now, the Singapore government, from what I know, in the last 10 years or so, started to shift gear towards the U.S. model away from the U.K. model. Why? Singapore is a very wealthy country today. Um, lots of capital to play with uh, as a sovereign state. Uh, a lot of talented students, but they say our students lack creativity. Okay, so they started investing in the arts about 10 years ago. I think they picked the brains of many American professors and educators to basically rebalance their strategy of relying on a very UK model that was not producing the creative talent that they need to take Singapore to the next level. So that's why you see NUS Yale emerging, right? NUS Yale, unlike NUS, is at a different level. And they specialize in liberal arts because they need to change the way that the Singaporean students think and work, right? Instead of relying on the big brother government telling them what to do every single second, they decided, okay, we need independent, creative thinkers, um, innovators uh, to really take Singapore to a whole new level in order to be competitive against other, other places like Hong Kong. And they're still doing that today. Now, what I can tell you is that the Vietnamese government is a huge fan of Singapore, politically and economically, right? I mean, Singapore is a role model for most countries around the world, but particularly Vietnam and China. They look at the way the Singapore government has uh, conducted itself for decades and, and, and been so successful. And they're basically trying to copy all the good stuff from, from Singapore government. And I think one, and so if you look at Singapore, if you're the Vietnamese government, you're observing Singapore and you know that Singapore is moving 
in this direction in terms of retraining his people or training a new generation of, of talent through education. If I'm the Vietnamese government, that's what I'm thinking. I need to invest more in liberal arts. I mean, I, I work in education a lot in Vietnam. I, I work with Dao Si Pham across three cities. Uh, I work right now, I'm starting a new foundation with Dao Bac Qua, which is the equivalent of MIT in Vietnam. And I can tell you, the yes, they might be very technically savvy, but are these going to be the next Bill Gates? Highly unlikely. You know, uh, they might come out and work for Schneider Electric or Procter & Gamble IT department. But if you ask them to be, you know, leaders in uh, these new industries, I don't think universities are there right now capable of uh, educating and producing this type of talent. So we have to invest. We have to invest in the sciences, but also in liberal arts education in order to open their minds to think creatively um, and, and, and laterally, right? Right now, I think the new thing is really about intersections of different disciplines rather than focusing on one discipline. In general, education in Asia does not promote intersections of dis different disciplines. In Vietnam, if you want to become a doctor, you start that freshman year in college. You apply to an undergraduate medical program. You don't come into Columbia and do liberal arts pre-med, med, MCAT, residency, no. You start that, you have to know that you want to become a doctor in school and pursue that track. And that is true across the fields. Now, from my experience, I didn't know what the hell I wanted to be, you know, until a couple of years at Latin teacher, college. Latin teacher, Latin teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Latin teacher, right. But my point is, you know, I think we're at an age, uh, you know, at that age in your late teens and 20s, you're really exploring your talents, uh, you know, through academic learning, interactions with professors and fellow students. You're really just beginning to open your minds to understand yourself. And that education, that time in college allows you to do that rather than following a singular track and, you know, have tunnel visions in your field. So right now, I think modern education Right, is incumbent upon us to, uh, whether it's a government or people or an institu institution like Columbia, to really start thinking about, you know, how do different industries intersect, and how do we promote learning laterally across these different fields, so that when they go into society, they are ready for these new challenges. And I think that's what Vietnam needs as well. And Singapore government took them a long time to realize this, but they're going down this path. And I would encourage the Vietnamese government to go down this path. And, and that's why they're supportive of Fulbright. We need more of that. I'm a big fan of that. So through our um, foundation's work, uh, you know, we give scholarships. But I spend a lot of time on values, right, on uh, producing or encouraging um, creative thinking, right, uh, in Building soft skills. Oh, just because you're a really smart engineer and you're very geeky and techy, I mean, can you present to investors? Can you do you know how to put together a presentation? Do you know how to talk to investors? Do you know how to lead your people? Can you build a company or run a department at some institution? I mean, it takes more than just an engineering degree, you know, or a management degree to do that. So how do we train our people? you know, to be able to think, think more deeply and widely about these issues. So I think you have to start at the undergraduate and graduate level. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's what I believe in and that's what our foundation seeks to do. So uh, Technology for All, we go in there, we support them with scholarships for four years now. And I know I'm gonna work with students who are very narrow minded in their fields. They're just trying to get a job, take care of their family, which is really important, right? I support poor kids who need to get a job, take care of themselves and support their families. But at the same time, once they achieve that, they're gonna go on to make, do bigger things. So I need to help them think about the future more deeply by, I work with the CEOs of tech companies in Vietnam and I asked them to, to basically be part of our effort by giving internships, pay internships, experiences, and and mentorship. 
so that these kids, they're from many regional provinces coming to Ho Chi Minh for the first time. When they work for oh, Shopee or video games or FPT, you know, these, these are big companies in Vietnam uh, who can actually help these students develop at a younger stage uh, at sort of starting sophomore year at university to start thinking about how to develop themselves beyond just doing their job or getting a job at that company. So we need business leaders to chip in and influence the way that these people think about themselves so that they become the future leaders. Uh, so that's, so to answer you, I hope I answered the question, which is, I think it's really important to, to have proof, you know, to have a little arts education, but similar to Columbia, to have a strong engineering and science program because our country needs both, frankly. We need, you know, technology. We need know-how in these areas to compete. But at the same time, we need some very creative people. We have them, uh, but we need the training to be better at an earlier stage Right to train and encourage. Uh, so I'm a fan of both. You know, I'm a huge fan of Fulbright. I've attended a lot of presentations from students. They're amazing. So one thing I can tell you, maybe I'm diverging a little bit, but one thing I can tell you is that if you visit Vietnam universities on the outside, oh, it might look like a 1950s, you know, structure like planted there by the Russians. If you meet the students, it's something else, right? Students are amazing, right? They, they, they look like they're afraid to talk to you, but if you get to know them, they're really wonderful and, and engaging and daring. So there's a tremendous amount of raw talent that we can develop, when, and, and you know that by interacting with them. And yet, so you have to look beyond the walls of these campus, campuses and realize that, wow, you know, we really have incredible young people in Vietnam that, that we can educate and develop. We have our first question, Nguyen. Um, yes, Peter, everything that you, oh, sorry, thank you. Peter, everything that you've said just resonates very deeply with me. So I work a lot on the Asian leadership deficit in America. And what's interesting is Asian Americans, right? We grow up uh, to be model minorities. And at some point, we hit the bamboo ceiling, Asian glass ceiling, however what you want to call it, right? It's so important, even in this country, right, for a whole generation that's been educated in the American education system with the liberal arts education, we still have challenges in this context, right? And so it's, it's a very, so I, I completely agree with what you're saying. As a community, like Asians, including Vietnamese Americans, we need to build out cultural fluency as well. Communications and, and leadership skills, they're so important, right, in driving economies. Um, so anyway, so I'm, I'm so um, happy to hear what's happening in Vietnam and, and that there's an appreciation, right, for you know, the hard skills and the soft skills and, and to marry the two. Now, my question is, um, you know, a lot of Vietnamese uh, from Vietnam, Vietnamese students study abroad. Can you comment on like the brain drain <laughs> situation and what's what's pulling them back to Vietnam? And that's only one segment because there's a whole generation of people like like Hang and myself, Asian Americans who want to build the bridge back to Vietnam to support the country. How are we reaching that segment? Because that that's something that we can leverage. Because I, I can tell you proportionally, we have so many Vietnamese Americans in the sciences, right? We are <laughs> very high in numbers. And so, you know, that, I think that's an opportunity. Um, so if you could just enlighten us on that scene. Thank you. Okay. Oh, well, thank you for the question. Uh, I'll answer both. Um, on, on this question of brain drain, um, and you, you is really interesting during COVID, um, I met a lot of Vietnamese students who are from Vietnam, study abroad, stayed here for one, two years, and they got called back by their parents during COVID. So I met a lot of, a lot of them, and I realized how many there are and how talented they are and how well-educated they are. 
Um, and they 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 were back in Vietnam because of COVID, and some stay. They they look at opportunities offered by by the Vietnam economy. Uh, some have gone back, but I would say it's not really a brain drain. Um, if you ask me to answer questions for students uh, who basically say, "Well, Peter, should I?" stay in the U.S. after I finish my degree at Columbia or wherever they study, or, or should I go back to Vietnam? My answer to them is stay in the U.S. Three, five years. Get yourself trained. What good are you to Vietnam if you come back with nothing? You know, I learned here first. I learned my best practices here. You know, how is a good company built, like, like Goldman or wherever you decide to work? How do they manage people? What are their values? Why are they so successful? We're too young as a country, as an economy, to be able to offer these learning lessons to, to young people. You know, Goldman's been around, I don't know, for 150 years. And you look at some amazing companies here, whether it's Microsoft or Google, they have a lot to teach you. And you're around the brightest minds. Why wouldn't you stay and learn from that before you come back to Vietnam? So I encourage students to the extent possible get your internships here, get a few years of experience. Don't try to be a Zuckerberg and, and, and leave school and start a company in Vietnam is stupid. Um, <clears throat> so I think be very practical um, and, and you know, really open yourself first so that you come back with something to offer. Uh, so for me, I think it's not a brain drain, it's a matter of time before that happens. Look at China. The Chinese students did the same thing. They came here, they stayed as long as possible. And then later on, when opportunities presented themselves and the government was ready by further privatizing, opening opportunities for very bright minds who were trained here on grounds of Columbia and Harvard and so on, other schools. And they went back and they became business leaders and you know great innovators. So I think Vietnam is going to go down direction. It's not there yet, but it will be. Second point is, you know, the Vietnamese American uh, diaspora, let's say the talents that we have in this room and elsewhere, you know, how does the government attract them to return to Vietnam to give back? You know, I think that that's been an issue for a long time and is an ongoing issue. Uh, a lot of VQs or Vietnamese overseas kind of come and go into Vietnam. Um, it's a very difficult adjustment process, including myself. Uh, business is done very differently. Um, I think to do it yourself is not easy in Vietnam, and in working with a local partner is not so not so easy. I think nine out of ten cases fail, and we're not alone. I'm sure other countries are the same. China is the same. Um, so yes, it is a is not an easy market to navigate. Uh, there are very few people who quote unquote make it, uh, but the government does encourage it. I mean, any one of you, whether you're VQ or foreign, can go back to Vietnam and start a company and employ and pursue opportunities. So it is open and available. The question is just, you know, are you going to be successful? Um, but I think the government is at least doing enough to make some options available to you. But I think, do you have the experience? Do you know how to navigate uh, and execute on the ground is really the question. Um, so I think that uh, that would grow as new opportunities emerge. Um, and, and I've seen a number of cases in recent years of that happening. Um, and I'm one of them. Uh, not, uh, but uh, I think it's, it's a growing economy. Things are moving fast. Um, and, and there are a lot of opportunities, but you need to be on the ground and you need to know what you're doing. Yes. First of all, your, your presentation is incredibly persuasive. And so I'm, Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm switching out of China studies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vietnam, Vietnam, China. It's not too late. Vietnam, China, US, Andy. That, that's the new thing. But just following up on the points that you were just making. So when you look at China and they, there was a time when the Chinese government thought a lot of the way that you seem to be describing that liberal education is good, creativity is good, private enterprise is good, foreign investment is good, but they seem to have 
come to feel that all those things are threatening the regime. And now I think you were just kind of alluding to this kind of tension between the regime and all of the things that you stand for. So in terms of your 11 or 12 bullet points about why Vietnam is such a great environment that is very convincing, but what about the political environment and how, where is the red line where <clears throat> creativity and independence, foreign capital and so on and so, and you as an entrepreneur of liberal education, cross over into threatening the regime? Where Where is that red line? Um, I think it's actually very easy to navigate uh, these issues. Uh, for example, in my educational work, I don't talk religion and I don't talk politics. I care about my people. I care about human beings and, and their well-being and, and what the uh, how they can contribute to society to, you know, create more harmony, solidarity. So, you know, it, it's very easy for me to do that. Uh, they 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 welcome you with open arms, um, and there's nothing that I do that threatens. You know, everything that I do, I simply want to to give back. I think if you have that attitude, there are no problems in Vietnam. Uh, same in business. Uh, the business leaders are obviously, uh, uh, you know very um, uh, mindful of these issues as well, Andy. Um, I think they they all contribute. And you saw that during COVID, you know, business, a lot of le business leaders really work with the government uh, to contribute resources um, to, uh, uh, you know, in terms of money, logistical support. Um, so I think the Vietnamese government is, is very smart and engaging uh, when it comes to working with business leaders. Um, in China's case, you know, because you're really talking about the likes of Jack Ma, Alibaba, and other leaders, uh, you know, who either have said some things wrong or done some things wrong, and and from the government's perspective, at least, uh, and um, I think in Vietnam, uh, maybe we we're very far from that point, uh, but I think everybody knows their lines. Uh, you know, we're we're in business. We're not trying to create systematic changes. There, there have been some cases in the past in Vietnam where, you know, you have uh, particular Vietnamese overseas um, uh, activists who go back and try to make noise and send messages. And I think it's impractical and it's not necessary. Um, and, and I think if you don't think that way or engage in those activities, it's a very non-threatening environment. You don't feel that kind of pressure where someone's watching over you when I conduct business. So I think if you have good motives and, and the right approach, whether it's business or education or whatever else, there, there are really no issues. I don't see these issues playing out in Vietnam, unlike China. Hi, uh, thanks so much for being here and talking with us. Um, Gu Zheng actually wants some of her students to ask questions in Viet, but that's too, too she, hard. She's, she's <laughs> testing her I'm sorry, be in English. Um, but I guess to what you were speaking about earlier of being one of the people who made it successfully, I mean, you have to share with us your tips and tricks, <laughs> especially I'm someone who's Vietnamese American and am interested in um, going back and doing work um, in Vietnam. And I guess, um, yeah, that's the first question I have. I have like so many, I wanna pick your thoughts, but. Yeah, I, I think um, you just gotta be practical and smart. I'll give you an example. In education, you know, I work with public universities. Uh, the administrators are, they do behave like government officials. Um, and I engage them all the time. And at first they may appear not so friendly, but once they get to know you and you get to know them, it becomes a friendship. There's trust. So it's, it's very Asian styled, right? <laughs> um, uh, we, we are largely a Confucianist society. Um, and I think that can be misunderstood sometimes. So the way I approach is, is really just going there with the best spirit of really trying to help 
and let them know that be very honest and open about it. You know, I'm an open book to them. Um, and we have developed very trustworthy, amazing relationships at, at these universities. And, you know, so when I went into that choir recently, you know, the other universities spoke highly of me. I walked in, they opened with open arms, and immediately I can do a deal and start a new foundation. So I think if, if you're well-intentioned and you develop trust, it's very easy. But I think that that's very important to do, uh, to understand how they work and to not be too critical. So I don't, like I said, I don't think about changing the system. I think about changing one life at a time, one student at a time. And if you do that, you know, that's uh, more than enough. And and, and they very, they're very supportive of that. So I think how you approach it, how you think about it, how you approach it, how you um, strike that partnership with them is really important. You're setting a, a very strong foundation if you do that. I mean, other things I think about is maybe you're asking about, you know, cultural differences, maybe is in business, maybe is in public sector work, nonprofit work. But, you know, I've learned some things uh, on the ground, uh, just being a real estate developer, for example, you know, I can sell a villa to a Vietnamese family for $2 million, but try asking them to pay for, like, you know, par car parking fee for $50,000. That's too expensive, Peter. You know, I'm like, that's $2. It's like, no, but we don't pay $50,000. We pay $30,000. And this is a billionaire talking to me, you know? Yeah. So... The Vietnamese don't like to pay. And, and, and the funny thing, and that goes with legal fees, that goes with consulting fees. So it's not good to be a consultant on the ground to the Vietnamese enterprises. It's okay to target the foreign enterprises. They'll, they'll pay you like, oh, $500,000 for a market and, you know, market entry study and strategy, you know, but don't try the other Vietnamese companies. It doesn't work. But they say, yeah, 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 yeah. And they get your report and they don't pay you. Yeah. Uh, and and that's true also, you know, whether it's legal, consulting, or parking. And that's just, you know, the way some societies are, you know. And you need to know that when you're doing business or in daily practice, you know. It's just they think differently. It's about, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want to get ripped off. I think you're ripping me off by charging me $1 extra, you know. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of these uh, cultural lessons that you learn on the ground, and you need to kind of know how to do business, whether it's nonprofit or, pro or for profit sector. Then these employees are very interesting to expand on that, right? So we we are very proud people, as you know, very emotionally charged, and it could be a young kid working for me, and I'm like having a bonus talk with him at the end of a year. And if he feels like he's offended by you, not me necessarily, but the, uh, uh, I have to pep talk this guy who got offended by somebody else. But you, you know, sometimes if you hurt their pride, they'll say, and Peter, please keep your bonus. Thank you. Uh, I'm leaving this company and I don't want the money. I tell you the story because I want to show you the, the pride of the people. Yeah, you, know, you have to know how to work with them. And I think as an overseas um, Vietnamese American, sometimes, you know, we're not very good at reading these things and understanding how locals work. And I think you need to be on the ground over a number of years to understand the, the number of things that matter, you know, to your success. You know, if the people leave you because you pissed them off but doing something that you think is harmless, but to them is harmful. You're in, you're in trouble as a company. You cannot retain talent. Uh, so so you know, these are some of my learning lessons over the years. I have a question. I'm going to frame around the openness piece that you talked about in one of your first slides. So I do a lot of youth leadership and soft skill training throughout the world. And I've been to Vung Tao. I love it. It's a beautiful city. But I just came back from a very intense trip where I was in Hong Kong for a few days with this group and then crossed over to Shenzhen. And it was amazing. I think because it was juxtaposed, those those two trips in one, um, the difference I felt and uh, just in terms of the openness and what I was able to say and do. I'm I wonder in terms of Vietnam, when you speak about openness, is that countrywide? 
that you describe or are there regions where there's less open arms or as you said openness i mean vietnam is right now this is really just a major city so we're talking about and right they're experiencing very fast urbanization so ho chi minh hanoi um da nang can tell um <clears throat> so the farming community used to be a huge percentage of uh, our labor force uh, i think we were maybe 60 70 percent agricultural about 10 15 years ago and now um farmers make up only about 24 percent of uh, our entire labor force. And, um, so in other words, you, you, we've been urbanizing and we've been also getting more efficient in terms of how we farm. Um, and that'll continue to happen. Now, as these people come into the major cities to work and, and basically it's better work and more money, right? As, as we grow and, and, and urbanize and Everybody has a mobile phone. I don't know if some of these people can afford it, you know. I pay them like 500 bucks a month, but they own two two Apple phones that cost $1,000 each. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's really interesting, but I can tell you, once you have a phone, right, you have access to the internet and to the world, to YouTube and Vietnam. You can access anything. Uh, I mean, sometimes they might, monitor the content, but they don't stop you from accessing. That's something very different from China. Um, and, you know, that you you can really put up some negative statements about what you see, right, in society, and the government pays attention, and the more spotlight there is on the issue, the quicker it gets resolved. Because as a party, you know, we uh, want to make sure that, hey, that they, they're doing a good job for the people, and they take that responsibility very seriously. Um, so it becomes a tool, actually, in terms of improving uh, governance and society, right? So in a small town where in the old days, you know, an official can get away with whatever. Nowadays, you know, you tape and you put it on the Internet, the central government comes and pays you a visit. Um, so it becomes a very effective tool of governing the country. And I think it's a positive. And, and the government does that. Um, but... It's one of the most plugged in economies in the world. That's why like Google is investing he more heavily now. Uh, we, we have more people, I think, with who, who are online than, than most populations as a total percentage of population. It's, it's really incredible. And payment systems are taken off and uh, online banking, but there's massive growth ahead. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the talk. It was incredibly insightful. Um, and as a student from Vietnam now studying at Columbia, I think I resonate a lot with your points, especially about um, building humanities background and really developing interdisciplinary um, skills. Um, and in your first slide, you mentioned that Vietnam has a relatively higher female labor participation rate compared to other countries. Um, I was wondering, in your personal experience, as well as your knowledge of Vietnam, how does the government um, promote female leadership across schools and corporations? Well, I, I don't know how the government is doing that. I can answer that from the point of view of an employer or um, you know, a, a fellow vitamins um, in Dao Su Pham, you know, Su Pham education is mostly women. So I think 9.5 out of 10 students that I support are female students, and they're, they're incredible. Um, from an employer perspective, I find women are easier to work with than men. I find Vietnamese men to be way too egotistical for my taste. <laughs> um, and I, I, I don't mean to upset uh, my fellow Vietnamese men in the audience, uh, but I, I would say, you know, we are a very patriarchal society, as you know. And, uh, you know, men men in, uh, have big egos in, in countries like this. And, and it's amazing, you know, like 
the mother would have to take care of children, her business, and at the end of the day, you know, cook meals for her husband. Um, it's almost like expected and socially accepted, you know. And so women are really strong and under a lot of pressures to perform from that perspective. And it's not fair, you know, uh, but it is what it is to even today. Um, and and I've known so many families, you know, where, yeah, the, the woman wears the pants in the family, but, you know, she still is asked to like, you know, kowtow to her husband uh, and, and, you know, fan his ego, you know, just to keep up a healthy marriage and relationship. It's just where things are, to be very frank, right? Uh, is it improving? Yes. Uh, the younger generation, such as yourself, you think differently. And, and young man like uh, your friend here also thinks differently. And that's just, yeah, and that's through education, right? Through exper experiences, uh, engagement with the West, internet. Um, and, and the new generation is probably not accepted. You know, if my daughter is asked to do that, she, she'll probably leave her husband. That wouldn't happen in in my generation or my father's generation, right? We just deal with it because it's, it's expected. It's like a social norm, but not, not for your generation. And the other thing I would say is just along the lines of education. I mean, today, everybody knows their ABCs. 20 years ago, I started going in in 06. I would say most people in your generation didn't speak good English. Now you guys are fluent. You know, English is part of the curriculum from a very young age. And there's been talks about, you know, Vietnam government making English uh, a, a, uh, uh, a first language as part of their curriculum. Because it's the ABCs. Of course, Vietnamese is number one, the most important, but English is not far from it. And again, they learned this from Singapore, right? Singapore decided to make English is number one language, is home language, uh, national language rather. And then of course, uh, uh, you can pick Chinese and Malay because it reflects the their their diversity of their population. And, um, but Singapore became very successful because everyone speaks English, all right? Even from a grandma, she speaks broken English, but you can understand her. You know, she's working to the labor force. Um, so, in my generation, that has changed a lot. And I promote English learning, right? But now I'm found, like, you know, these students, unfortunately, don't have the resources to learn English. So I hire teachers. And I get volunteers to teach English so that they can make more money. I'm very practical, right? I say, okay, you go to McDonald's. You work in McDonald's for your summer job. If you speak English, you're in the cash register, you get pay $1.50 to $2 an hour. If you don't speak English, you're back to making fries, you make 50 cents an hour. So, and if you speak English, even as my front desk secretary, I pay you 500 bucks an hour. But I need someone who speaks English and answer the phones. If you don't, you're not going to make 500 bucks. You can go to a local bank and make 150 bucks a month. So, English is very important to their survival, you know, to, to their ability to earn and help their families. Uh, but it's becoming extremely common, as you know now. But the privileged class, of course, that's easy. The question is, what about the majority of the people who are underprivileged? You know, how do they really get their fair share? And that's what my philanthropy work is about. Anyways, I'll cut that short. <laughs>